All right, I'm Ross. Thanks so much for being with me, broadcasting from the Western Governors Association annual meeting, and so pleased to be joined by Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, the incoming chairman of the WGA. So congratulations on that, as if you don't have enough to do, and now you get to do that too. And congratulations on being one of the, one of the new governors here. On, on your election, a guy with n- no political experience, really, as far as I know, just said, you know what, I need, I need to do something here. So that's pretty fantastic. Well, yeah, it was. But, uh, of course, a big team effort on getting elected and a lot of, you know, kudos to all the supporters that helped make it happen. But uh, honored to have the opportunity to serve uh, the state of North Dakota, a place where I was born and raised and love. Uh, and North Dakota, like a lot of places, is facing a, a lot of uh, challenges but has enormous opportunities. And one of the things, uh, after spending 30 years in the in tech background, primarily in software, but with an ag, grew up in a small town with an ag background, mm-hmm. uh, one of the things you realize is that every state in the West, every state every, is, you know, every job, every industry, every community, uh, every institution, every university, every K-12 through system, uh, <clears throat> Everything is being disrupted by technology, yeah. and and having that lens has been uh, really helpful and really interesting these first two years that I've been in office, and and really honored to have an opportunity to serve as uh, chairman of WA. And Ross, thank you for coming all this way to be at our conference. Yeah, I love it. I, I heard a guy talking the other day at a a different kind of event about how. Uh, disruption doesn't necessarily have to be destructive. It can be, but it doesn't have to be if you if you manage it right. And I think with your background, you're a, you know you're a perfect guy to try to manage d- disruption in a positive way. Uh, and and before we get on to some of the specific things, I, I was just kind of curious how well you know Jared Polis because his background is also you know making technology and selling it for a lot of money like you did. Uh, he's a liberal. Democrat, and you're at least a fairly conservative Republican. I don't want to describe describe you. You're a Republican. He's not. Um, I think you guys would have some really interesting stuff to talk about. Oh, look at that. I just heard KOA. <laughs> um, well, yeah, we had a chance to meet uh, the governor uh, at uh, NGA in February for the first time. Of course, he was just elected last November, but uh, I feel like we uh, hit it off, you know, initial conversations because there are some things that certainly uh, – you know, technology doesn't recognize party lines. Right. Uh, and when it's uh, disrupting business models and the way government has done it in the past, it doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter which party you're part of. I mean, some of the states uh, I've got uh, out of date approaches and expensive uh, historical ways of doing things that can be done better, faster, cheaper uh, by, by applying technology. And we can apply that to solve, uh, you know, some of the big issues that are facing uh, the country and certainly some of the big issues that are facing uh, the governors in the western half of the United States. Yeah, the, the inertia of legacy systems can be just crippling. Um, so one of the th- one of the th- incentives that you get as being chairman of the WGA is you, you can really push a couple key issues, and there usually is chairman's initiatives kind of things through the WGA. And I, you, you kind of hinted at this in your opening, you know, talking about r- issues facing rural North Dakota. I think some of these are, are the same issues facing rural Colorado. So why don't you talk about a couple of those? Well, I, I, we'll, we'll announce the new initiative uh, uh, Tomorrow, so mm-hmm. we won't uh, we won't do the pre-release here. But, okay. but I would just say that again, you're right on, Ross. I mean, there are, are a number of things when we uh, look at the rural West uh, where we totally have in common. Uh, these Western states have a lot of intersection uh, with the federal government because of the amount of, you know, BLM, Park Service, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, all of our tribal partners th- that are out here. You know, the federal government has their fingers deeply into large amounts of land and mm-hmm. in, in land use policy in the West, and of course that affects uh, affects the environment affects water affects agriculture affects energy development it affects tourism and affects outdoor recreation and these are all the things that the western states economies are built on right and so it's a uh, one of the things when we do convene here it's great at our conference that's uh, kicking off today is we'll have a couple of cabinet secretaries here mm-hmm. and i think that's really important for us to you know create a space for dialogue between the states uh, remembering, as I like to remind people, that the states created the federal government and not the other way around. Yeah. And so that the states, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, I think would uh, be well served because we live in these states. Who's going to care more about the water? Who's going to care more about the soil? Who's going to care more about the air than those of us that live here? I think we would care about it more than a, you know, a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. So it's a, you know, so the Western Governors Association has got some special commonality that brings us together. But then that economy, which is layered on top of that, again, uh, you know, know, the challenge we're facing on workforce. This is the first time in the nation's history when we have more 
jobs available in our country than we have people seeking jobs. And so if that's the case, it's not a, no longer economic development uh, is not about job creation. It's about it's about having the, the right workforce, the skilled workforce that can do those jobs. And a skilled worker can choose wherever they live. The West has got a lot of advantages. We have, you know, great communities across the West uh, that provide that outdoor recreation, provide that quality of life, provide that thing, you know, where you can live in a more rural area but still be connected to the world and still be, you know, participating. And so I think the the future for uh, for the Western half of the United States is very bright, but we're, you know, we're competing for the rest of the world with talent. Well, and, and, it's, and by the way, for those of you just joining us, my special guest, Governor Doug Burgum of North Dakota, the incoming chairman of the Western Governors Association. So in, in Denver, we've got issues of incredibly expensive real estate. And one of the issues, one of the things that comes up is, might people be able to leave this very expensive, densely populated, maybe a little bit polluted urban environment and, and actually sort of reverse some of the demographic trends we've seen and start moving more rural again. It sounds like you think that could happen. And one of the things that I would want to ask you about, especially from your perspective as both a, a fiscal conservative and a private sector guy, is how do you envision, let's say, rural broadband, which is something that's come up in Colorado a lot as a conversation, how do you envision doing things that help rural parts of your state, rural parts of the western U.S., without doing too much spending of taxpayer money, which wouldn't, I imagine, be high on your list of things to do, spending a lot of taxpayer money? Well, I think broadband you bring up is absolutely key, but we have, but we have to think of broadband as infrastructure at some level. And all of the Western states have all been burdened because you've got huge geographies. Uh, it's just take, take North Dakota. North Dakota, just by itself, which is not the biggest of the Western states, North Dakota is as exactly the same size as the six New England states. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut equals North Dakota. Wow. And we have a fraction of that population, and yet we have to have all of the uh, – you know, farm to market roads. We've got to have all of the ability to, you know, have transportation move across or through our state. Mm -hmm. And so every Western state is burdened uh, with a high cost of infrastructure. Right. Uh, and then you cut along comes broadband and we're saying, you know, we, we can't, we're going to spend a billion dollars on, on roads and nothing on broadband mm -hmm. when broadband is what's going to also drive the efficiencies of everything we're doing in K through 12 and healthcare, you know, agriculture, energy. And so we have to think of that as core infrastructure in the, in the future of the, the world is how I think about it. But then mm -hmm. the way we, and you talk about Denver being an expensive place to live, all of our urban areas for the last 70 years, we've built our urban areas around automobiles, not right. around people. We build them around automobiles mm -hmm. and there's a technology, there's a transformation, uh, a technology, the technology, the smartphone is enabling uh, new business models, uh, collaborative consumption. I mean, think of Uber, think of Lyft, uh, think of you know, scooters, think of bikes, uh, you know, jump bikes. Uh, I mean, think, you know, line bikes. I mean, think of all this stuff. There are so many different ways of transportation and they're like, Oh, you're in North Dakota. People ride bikes, you know, only a few months of the year because of, well, no, it's fat tire bikes, uh, you know, small things. I mean, most people only need to move you don't, you know, some days you need a car to drive 200 miles. Some right. days you need something to get a mile away. There's going to be a whole explosion in mobility that won't even look like the last 70 years, which have been either it's an automobile or nothing. I mean, we have an explosion coming there. And when we do that, we can start thinking about how do we redesign our cities because we spend enormous, a disproportionate amount on the parking and the infrastructure related to automobiles. And we're not spending enough on the things that relate to uh, other forms of mobility or to broadband. And of course, that ties back to health because as a country, America, it's like, oh, America's, we spend too much on health care. Well, we also have got a, in the western part of our state, if you can't park your car where you can see the door where you're going to walk into, you know, there's, you know, let's vote the mayor out. Uh, I mean, there's this, there's an entitlement around, around uh, some of the ways we've designed our cities, you know, which doesn't match up with health because if, you know, we spend 4 trillion in the United States on healthcare, 1 trillion of that is related to chronic diseases, you know, like diabetes, obesity, and heart disease, all of which would be solved if we just walked a little bit more. You know, so there's, I mean, these, some of these all things all tie together, yeah. uh, but in, you know, we have a chance to lead in the West. We have a chance to, you know, think things differently and we have a chance to, um, you know, shift the, 
uh, investments that the government has made traditionally in infrastructure to places that are smarter and more efficient, and that's going to free up capital and it's going to free up opportunity for the private sector. Uh, let me ask you one last question. We've got a, a minute or so left, maybe two minutes. Given your background coming from private sector, software development, VC, and I've done a bunch of you know small scale, not your scale, but small scale VC, angel investing, and all, all this kind of stuff, it is a different mindset from a uh, from a, a bureaucracy, right? What has been the biggest surprise to you coming from the private sector and then going into government, how those things are different, and what are you trying to change in, North, in, in the way North Dakota government operates based on lessons you've learned from the private sector? Well, I think the big shift is, I'll bring it back to the dollars. You know, government, they think about spending. You know, government spending, you know, and people talk about big government. Big government's bad, small government better. I think good government is better. And good government isn't all about spending. It's about investing. It's about focusing on the outputs versus the inputs. But, you know, every governor I've talked to, uh, they get together and everybody fights about we need more money for this, more money for that, more, you know, education, health care, whatever. Like, they want more money. That's an input. Mm-hmm. And I, we were trying to shift the conversation, the dialogue in North Dakota, which is rather than talking about inputs, let's talk about outputs. How do we have, how do we have better, better outcomes in education, better outcomes in health care? And then and if once we decide we, what we want and how we're going to get it, it may or may not take more money. It might take less money. It might take a different approach. Mm -hmm. But everybody believes, and I think the common, often the citizenry, if a, you know, if a budget goes up, they win. If we have more money for K-12, through then somehow our kids are better off. Right. Well, we, we, there's all kinds of cases where we've spent way more money and the outcomes got worse. Yeah. So we, we really want to focus on outcomes. Private sector has to focus on outcomes. And, you, and, if you, and instead of spending, in, you don't spend in the private sector, you invest. And you invest in stuff that has a positive return. And we have to have that, bring that mindset uh, to, to every day to what we do in North Dakota, which is it's, it's, not about who, it's not who spends the most wins. It's about who invests the smartest wins. And we get a return on investment for our health care dollar, our education dollar or infrastructure dollar. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And you also have to make sure that uh, whoever they are don't redefine the word invest just to mean spending on something that I want to spend money on. Because there is a difference between spending and investing, but sometimes in a political conversation, that difference gets lost. Yeah, absolutely. But you actually can track a return on investment for a dollar spent uh, by a government entity, just like you can a private entity. If you if you have the discipline to do it and the right kind of metrics, you can find out when we spent that, did we get the right re the return that we were looking for? Okay, give me 20 seconds on this. Are you happy so far in your uh, new job? I'm, you know, I was honored... Uh, and love the private sector. It's transformational. All the work I did there felt that I had a purpose. We were, you know, improving people's lives, uh, empowering people and inspiring success. And we brought those six words with us to government. We said government can improve lives, empower people and inspire success. And again, you know, and I'm great. I wake up every day. Being a governor is one of the great jobs in the world uh, because you can make a difference for your people in your state every day. And uh, it's, it's like a complete honor to serve and we're having a blast. Well, Governor Doug Burgum, the incoming chairman of the Western Governors Association. Thanks for joining me here at the uh, annual meeting of the WGA. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing what you do as incoming chairman uh, of the WGA. I'm sure you you're looking forward to seeing that, too. Like, likewise. So, anyway, thank you, yeah. Ross, for being here. Okay. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We'll be right back on the Ross Kaminsky Show.